Hey guys, Chris Bercher, knowledge plus experience equals wisdom. This is episode 44, Unnatural Selection and Unlearning. So in episode 43, the, the, the prior solo episode, I laid out a, an argument for uh, why uniqueness and diversity is important and why I think it's inherent in our DNA that each individual person sort of develops their purpose or their, you know, realizes their uniqueness to make their unique contribution to the world so that we can make the world a better place, if you will. And this is all part of a bigger project that I'm currently sort of hashing out in my head and doing it in real time on the podcast because, you know, it works for me. So the idea of unnatural selection isn't new. Others have proposed it, and it's sort of a play on the idea of natural selection where environmental and biotic and abiotic elements interact to uh, determine the fitness of an individual based on their genetic makeup, their genotype, and their phenotype, their expression of themselves in their environment. Some animals, some plants, whatever, some organisms are better suited for things that change in the environment, and some are not as well suited. And generally, fitness is the preferred condition of natural selection, and individuals that are fit are selected for to reproduce and perpetuate in the environment. And that's how species are formed, and that's how species exist. And it's kind of sucky uh, because obviously some organisms are selected against because the way that they are based on their genetic information and the way that their phenotype or their physical appearance and expression in the environment happens at, at birth or conception or wherever and how it's modified by the environment isn't as fit. And so they're selected against. And generally, those organisms don't have as much success either reaching reproductive age, surviving, or having successful reproduction and rearing of offspring, and thus perpetuating their selves. And the genetic information that does have success and, with, and is considered fit by the selective forces of the changing environment do uh, persist in the environment. So that, that implies a system. And all of this is drawing upon my background in ecology and evolutionary biology. And I pretty much believe that our description, the paradigm that we have about natural selection and evolution and how it relates to DNA and the speciation and the perpetuation of organisms on Earth in our universe is probably pretty accurate, or at least it offers a really good description. I haven't heard a better one. And I'm just extending that to sort of apply to the the socio-psychological realm of humanity. And sometimes I think, you know, there's a genotype and that's sort of your individual description based on your DNA. And then there's your phenotype, how that DNA is expressed in the environment. And that has to do with meiotic cell division and reproduction and development, and also the interaction of that organism as it grows with the biological and, and abiotic conditions in the environment. So you might be born with dark skin that makes you more able to withstand ultraviolet rays, but you also might develop uh, some critical thinking skills as an adolescent that benefit you in that environment. And, and so that both of those things, sort of intrinsic DNA and then extrinsic interaction of your DNA and your phenotype with environmental. And I think that should be extended to include the development of our minds. Because what makes humans different from the great apes? What differentiates humans from all the other organisms that resulted from natural selection through evolution? And that's our psychology, our, our social dynamics, our, our minds, our, our, not, not, not our brains, but this consciousness or something. And, and I, I'm not quite ready to go there yet, but just to sort of lay out the baseline. And what I'm arguing today with respect to unnatural selection is what others have observed and I have read and heard and sort of makes sense to me. Uh, you know, so first assumption is we have about 200,000 years of being homo sapiens. So something happened. Our species di was diverted off of the you know, um, homo erectus or whatever, whatever you know, uh, our next most recent ancestor was. Based on, again, natural selection, something happened in meiosis. We were different. And then that lineage started to evolve and uh, interact with different selective forces in its own path. 200,000 years of that. And then, so that's 
a long time. <laughs> it's a lot of generations. And then about 10,000 years ago, maybe 12, maybe 20, we don't really know, we sort of switched gears in a pretty dramatic way. Uh, we went from being fairly nomadic or moving around to being fairly stable or staying still as a village or a culture or, or a population. And these were generally, the groups of people were pretty small, uh, but we were social, we moved together, and bef before, you know, 10,000 years ago, we would move around and find resources, and then when we would not be able to be successful in that particular set of environmental conditions, we would move to another place in search of better environmental conditions, and that worked, presumably, for 190,000 years. And many people will say that it's the discovery of agriculture and being able to manipulate our environment that allowed us to settle down. And most people view this as a good thing. And if you look at the way things worked out, it led to the Industrial Revolution and now iPhones. Um, but I would argue that it, it, it also represents, we need to look at the dark side of that coin, right? It also represents a shift from when humans modified ourselves to fit the environment. And that's sort of what natural selection is all about. If, there's, um, if you're running out of a food source, then you can move and find another food source um, and sort of work with what you have. You're not manipulating the earth in any way. Well, maybe in minor ways, but not in a way that changes the natural selective forces that you are exposed to. With agriculture, we started to manipulate our environments like a beaver building a dam. We became ecosystem engineers where we started to plant crops in specific areas so that we knew we would have enough food. And then we started, of course, manipulating those crops and selecting for the biggest ears of corn. And we started doing some armchair genetics uh, of our own and experimenting. But the major shift, and the point is, and I'm trying not to base any judgment on this, is we went from modifying our behavior to suit the earth to modifying the earth to suit our behavior. So this is a pretty dramatic shift. And we started then, and this might have started before. I haven't you know, considered other options, but this is a pretty major shift where we started introducing unnatural selective forces. Now, I got to step back for one second and say, I agree with the naysayers who say that, well, humans are natural and our behavior is natural. And so whatever we do, if it's ripping coal out of a mountain or setting fires or, uh, you know, irrigation, those are all natural things because they came from us. Okay, okay, okay. That, that's, that's a re legitimate argument. So it's hard to use the term unnatural selection if it's something that was created by humans. Maybe there's a better word. The point is that the preceding billions of years of natural selection forces changed because of us in a very significant way that has led to, if you believe in it, something like climate change, where we've actually modified the, the climate on the planet. So that's pretty big. Now, a beaver building a dam on a creek and stopping it from a flowing water system to a still water system, is, it's pretty major, I guess, but it's not <laughs> the same thing. I guess it would be better for me to argue that a beaver is also exhibiting unnatural selection or a bee building a bee colony building a hive is unnatural selection. But I don't think you would you would agree with that. I don't think that's a legitimate argument because those things are temporary. They're small. Um, I'm talking about a major shift. And maybe up till a thousand years ago, our modification of the planet to suit our needs wasn't really unnatural. Uh, but with the onset of te the technological and the industrial revolution, the, the invention of medicine uh, that, that changed our lifespans and our health, uh, the development of irrigation systems that brought us water so we no longer, the understanding of my, microbial biology so we didn't poop in the water that we drank, um, a lot of these things are, are major shifts, and some of them are awesome. Uh, but my point here is for some of these things maybe aren't so awesome. And the second element of this unnatural selection argument is that the process of manipulating the earth has led to problems. Now, climate change being sort of the most obvious one, 
Um, but I, I just today on the radio heard a story they that they discovered a new species of mosquito in Florida, one that didn't evolve there, one that came from somewhere else, and the one that has the potential to carry a couple of diseases that we don't currently have here. So this is a problem, and that this is an example of uh, invasive species where we now have the capacity by flying and and boat you know boats travel. We can actually move organisms from parts of the world to other parts of the world where they don't belong. And 99.9 times out of 100, this creates way more problems than it solves. Something like, um, you know, when, when we altered the flow of water coming into the Great Lakes, we introduced the sea lamprey into the Great Lakes which destroyed the fishery in the Great Lakes because those things didn't evolve together. The natural selective forces had kept sea lampreys in an environment where they weren't really a problem. Sure, they were parasitic on some fish and some fish died. But when you drastically alter the environment by now allowing sea lampreys into the Great Lakes, where there's just a bunch of huge giant fish that don't swim very fast like fish in a barrel, right, for these sea lampreys to come in and, and, and decimate in a matter of years because they didn't evolve together. The fish in the Great Lakes don't have any natural defenses or natural behavioral modifications to, to help them avoid uh, dying from sea lamprey, whereas in the, in the Sargasso Sea or the, you know, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean, uh, all those animals evolved together. So sea lampreys and other animals co-evolved, and so, and so they were responding to the same natural selection forces, including each other. I, I, that's that's a pretty big tangent. But the the process of introducing quick monolithic changes to an environment has a there you know a, a cascading effect on all the organisms that live there. And this the, a lot of this has to do with the fact that co-evolution. If you if you take an ecosystem, um, you know, for simplicity's sake, let's say a coral reef, everything that sort of belongs and has always been a part of the coral reef that you see in a snapshot today, if there was no uh, human intervention, would have evolved there together. All the selection pressures, including interactions among the species that are there, happened according to the same timeline, according to the same rules. And what we see in that picture is an example of a ecosystem, a group of organisms and abiotic and biotic conditions that have that are a result of coevolution and the individual responses of those species to this, the same selective forces. And it took a really long time. I mean, that's the thing I just don't think we can understand or appreciate is how long these things take. Now, if you go to that coral reef system and introduce uh, a fish that didn't evolve there, like a lionfish, uh, that has the ability to uh, uh, take advantage of a resource like smaller fish that have no defense mechanisms against it, that didn't evolve together, that didn't have time to react to the selection pressures of this, you know, uh, really opportunistic predator, then what's going to happen? Well, the turkey fish quickly eats all the, they're just, it's the fish sitting in the barrel. And to the point where they're actually um, drastically affecting the numbers of fish there and their ability to reproduce. So that's a selective pressure that could be leading to the extirpation or the extinction of many small coral reef fishes that they had no chance to react to. They didn't have time. It just happened just like that. And so there is another scenario where the ocean temperatures change and the currents change and somehow a lionfish ends up somewhere where it didn't evolve and, and, and repopulates. And, and that's a thing. But what we're doing is we're speeding that process up. That part of it isn't natural. And in natural, I guess, I mean... Kind of the way it was for the preceding billion years. We have drastically changed the rate of selection forces, the propensity, the location, but mostly the time. And if you, and when people talk about climate change and really back off, uh, what we're really talking about is the rate of change that, that has happened. That um, we as humans have 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 this magical capacity to do all these wonderful things, but the side effect is that we can have dramatic shifts in the timeline, the natural 
pre-existing billions of years timeline for these things to happen. And now we've just, we've altered that. And so the point is that we have created these problems, invasive species, climate change, the spreading of diseases, uh, the, 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 the loss of species. I'm not sure if I said that already. Uh, and then if, and then that's all just sort of the ecological world. If you, I would further argue, like I said before, with this third element, genotype, phenotype, and then like socio-psychotype, we have created mental problems. I mean, if you were to take, if you were an alien species and you came down here and you took a snapshot of the human race, and there might be all kinds of observations that you would make, but at some point you would make an observation that we seem to be looking for something really hard that we haven't found yet. There seems to be, I would think, and this could be completely ethnocentric and sort of my own biases coming into play here, but just for argument's sake, you would think that uh, I, I, uh, somebody observing humans for the first time would eventually figure out that there's a little bit of dissatisfaction, there's a little bit of problem, there's a little bit of overpopulation, there's a, a huge difference between the have and have-nots, there's extreme and widespread poverty, and then there's extreme and very isolated wealth and everything in between. And and it seems to be getting worse and worse. And there's weird behaviors and political systems and religions that just don't really seem to make any sense. And I think at some point during the development of these ideas, one can associate the, the sort of beginning of this with, uh, might be coincident with our decision to introduce unnatural, maybe non-natural is a better, or human-induced selective forces on our planet. That's gotten to the point where, you know, there, there probably is too many people here, um, there's, there's not enough resources to go around, or it's just a really poor allocation of those resources. You know, I'm not really sure... Actually, I am pretty sure there there are ways that we could solve these problems, but they haven't been part of our evolution. You know, I would think that elements of the human psychology and sort of community systems, there would have evolved ways to ensure a better outlook for everyone as individuals. And it just didn't work out like that. And humans have an amazing capacity to survive. So even in the worst possible conditions, when no one would argue that an individual is thriving, that they're merely barely surviving, I'm thinking of things like starvation and disease-ridden um, populations that were spread around the earth, uh, no one would argue that that was probably a bad result, right? And, and, and surely in, in, in the world of natural selection, going back 100,000 years, there's lots of bad things that happened. Sharks ate seals, you know, uh, seal pups got eaten, you know, kittens got eaten by birds. And all this is really sad and bad stuff. And maybe all we see in the world today is sort of an element of these bad things. Um, but, but again, the rate and the pace uh, are astronomical. And so my argument is, that I'll carry on hopefully into the next episode is that we really need to look at where we are as humans using this 10,000 year period, look at where we were prior to this shift and sort of analyze uh, whether or not anything is valid in what I'm saying. And I think I can probably do some of this research on my own. And, and actually, I already have done enough, and I think the argument is pretty sound. And then the next step is sort of, okay, okay, maybe we made some mistakes, but given our incredible brains and minds and, and, and the things that we've learned and our ev evolution, I think we can then go in and parse out the things that where we may have, we may want to reconsider. Rather than make things like... Um, inequality or waste, you know, I'm thinking of food waste, rather than say this is just the way it is, or we can't do any better than this, or it's just an artifact of, of the way things work, maybe we really ought to take the time to make a list of these places that we could improve upon and sort of unlearn some of what we've learned through natural selection. What's wrong with that? 
why there's I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't want to assess your condition, whatever it is, as a business, as a car, you know, a motor, uh, whatever it is, uh, uh, your pet, you, you, where you wouldn't want to say, how are you doing? Let's do a little checkup and then say, OK, we got these problems. What might might some of these problems be related to the decisions that we've made as humans with respect to our evolutionary path? What could we have done differently? What could we do differently? Can we can we create causal lineages of we made these decisions to grow crops and live in stable villages? Where what did that lead to that could be related to problems that we have now? There's nothing wrong with that. I, I actually I would argue and I will argue that this is our responsibility. You know, I, I'm so tired of the argument that, well, the coal companies had to make money and they raped the earth, but, you know, that's just the way it was. That's how it had to be. No, 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 that's wrong. <laughs> we don't have to do those things anymore. We made some mistakes, and we should stop making those mistakes <laughs> into the future. And so there is the the nutshell of what I think unnatural, maybe non-natural selection is the timeline for when it happened, and some food for thought about whether or not we can put together some pieces um, of this puzzle to figure out where we are, where we were, and where we're going. That's episode 44, uh, Unnatural Selection and Unlearning. I look forward to developing this idea with you further, and uh, next week we'll have another Curiosity interview series, that's episode 5, and then I'll be back with episode 45 in two weeks. Okay. Chris Bircher, Knowledge Plus Experience Equals Wisdom. Thanks, guys.